Everything you're about to see is a true story. Events that happened in the virtual world in the beginning of the 21st century. A game world that revolutionized role-playing, championing a particularly hardcore and immersive style where progress and leveling were excruciatingly slow. And each player could only play one character. And each character had only one life. Death was permanent. In this world, everything can happen. The roll of a dice can make the difference between life and death, a world where actions had true consequences. This is the story of Hayes. This video is a recreation entirely based on the written records that the players have kept, personal character journals, letters, chronicles and chat logs that managed to survive, most of it salvaged from the old forums before it disintegrated, other resources I found thanks to speaking to old players. This is a glimpse into the past, into their life and inside their world. Narumer, an uncharted, inhospitable, inescapable island, its shores strewn with shipwrecks. When the game world of Haze was new and first came into life, it was entirely owned by NPCs. Such were the leaders of the dwarves, the humans and the elves that had lived in isolation from each other. Once players began to arrive, they had the potential to change it. Indeed, our story begins with the arrival of players. Lightning struck, a storm brewed in the sea. The island of Narumer was subjecting its will upon a slave ship from the Duchy of Daggerford. It was about to have its way, about to change the fate of that ship for good. On a fortunate turn of the tide for the survivor of this wreckage, those who survived became free. What would later be known as the Great Wreck of 1372, the now free folks of Daggerford, a collective of humans, halflings and a few half-breeds, arrived to the eastern shores of Narumer. By chance or fate, the dwarves crashed at the northern shore, welcomed by the snow, while the elves crashed at the southern shore, straight into a forest. The island had something in store for each of them. Through the storm of the sea and the rain and the cold, broken masts of the ships on that graveyard of old, we were stopped on the shore of the Forbidden Isle, its old secrets unfold to the sight of our eyes. Gilaren Anatar. At the center of the island, the Washers, as they later came to be known, discovered a small ramshackle hamlet with a towering keep in its center, Coffinswood. On the throne of Coffinwood sat one Geoffrey Lionsben, a devout of Helm the Watcher and a tyrant. He left the handful of inhabitants mostly to themselves. He watched the Washers warily when they arrived. Fearing the washers would be a threat to him and his rule, Lyons Ben instituted a number of reforms to maintain the order in the face of the new arrivals. His first action was to recruit the humans into the militia. Freedoms were then restricted for the rest, with half-elves and halflings among the worst affected by the so-called race laws. Halflings were required to keep their hands in plain sight at all times and to empty their coin purses to anyone who asked. Those who ran afoul of the race laws were banished, some were executed. Both of these groups were the object of considerable ridicule, scorn and humiliation. Some of the washers who now held powerful positions conspired to murder Lion's Ben, but such attempts were to no avail. Lion's Ben would not be caught off guard. Ironically, it was Lion's Ben's sense of honor, perhaps his only redeeming quality, that led to his downfall. One of the Washers, Deacon Eric Caladon, another devout of Helm, challenged him to a duel. Lionsman answered the challenge, a fight to the death. Thus, with a crowd of spectators gathered, the two Helmites clashed swords. A final blow landed at the end of the tense fight. Standing over Lionsman's body, 
It was Deacon Eric that emerged victorious and proclaimed, I have defeated the Dark Heart. I claim his position as mine. Those events marked the transfer of power from NPCs to the players. And so began a new era in Coffinswood. The players became rulers of their own hamlet. This didn't just happen in Coffinswood. The same began happening with the elves and the dwarves. The rule of power was being transferred to the players. In the north, Thoric Oakenshield is elected to become leader of the dwarves, while in the south, the elven washers, dubbed the Lost by the original elven inhabitants, had crowned Astraea as Queen of the Elves to rule upon the Forest Kingdom. In a land devoid of iron, Caladon ruled with an iron fist. He styled himself as both Lord and Magistrate. None questioned the legitimacy of his rule after Lion's Ben had fallen in a manner of his own making. Caladon's first act as magistrate was to repeal the race laws put into place by his predecessors, putting a stop to the torture of the non-human races. But in Coffinswood, power was a fleeting affair. It began with taxing the use of the Keep's library, which angered many of the citizens. Break-ins soon followed. Eric had then made further laws and restrictions and targeted the halflings. The halfling laws. Halflings seen running were subject to search, seizure and fine and were barred from the keep. Eric was not the benevolent ruler that some might thought him to be. The voice of dissent became louder and louder. Kamali Toback, an apprentice in the magic arts, publicly called for the overthrow of Eric, who in turn named her a renegade and called for her arrests. Before he managed to capture her, Kamali had fled Coffinswood. Eric was seething with anger. To the end of his ruling days, Eric would make it his personal mission to haunt her wherever she was. Capturing Kamali would become his dark obsession. But Kamali remained well hidden. She sought refuge with the elves, and then later with the dwarves. Cadence, Eric's closest advisor, a half-elven bard, would also be relentless in her search for Kamali. Yet Eric's obsession with Kamali would have to be put on hold, for a greater threat emerged. In the second week of Alent, 1372-DR, the year of wild magic, a great host of orcs assembled in the north under a single banner and began moving south towards Coffinswood. Scouts confirmed that the orc host was at least 200 strong and would reach the hamlet by the week's end. For the first time in the history of Narumer, the humans had made an expedition to the dwarven land of Kalandur to ask for aid. The request was for the dwarves to build a wall in the northern front of Coffinswood. Had Eric only known how close Kamali was within his grasp? Indeed, as Eric negotiated with the dwarves, the secret slipped. When Eric learned that Kamali was hiding there, he became furious, demanding she would be handed to him at once. A fight nearly broke between Eric and his men with the dwarves. Negotiations broke. Eric, Cadence and the rest of his escort went back to Coffinswood empty-handed. Cadence wrote a letter to the dwarves. I deeply regret the action taken by the Lord Magistrate during his visit to your lands. You must understand, the renegade Kamali Tobak has tested the very limits of his patience, and the invasion of the orcs weighs heavily on his mind. We had learned only this week that she was giving sanctuary by the elves, and when he learned that she had been also to Kalandur, he jumped to a most unfortunate conclusion. If any assault has been made to your honor, or to the honor of your kin, I ask that you accept my sincere apology, and find it within yourself to overlook his mischaracterization of your intentions. Nevertheless, the orc threat remains. We are in need of masons to build the wall and brave souls to man it. If we fall in this, the spawn of Grumash will undoubtedly turn their eye to you. The elves will not come. You are our last hope. Thanks, by large, to Cadence's letter, tensions were somewhat relieved. The dwarves would eventually come to Coffinswood and help the humans build the wall in what would later be known as Caladon's Wall, but neither the elves nor the dwarves would fight with them in that battle. The humans were left to fend for themselves. And so, 
in the northern wall of Coffinwood, at the eve of the battle, a song was sung by Lady Cadence to inspire the defenders of Coffinswood against the impending doom of an army of orcs. Mighty men of Coffinswood, do not be forlorn. The great test stands before you now, and duty is forsworn. Our enemy is approaching. I say let him come. Show him that you have no fear. Let them sing our song. Mighty men of Coffinswood, mighty men of Coffinswood, mighty men of Coffinswood, mighty men of Coffinswood. Let not your soul be torn. We all draw swords together now to face the coming storm. The enemy will fall before us if your hearts be true. So send them all back to Grummish now. Let them sing our song. Mighty men of Coffinswood, mighty men of Coffinswood, mighty men of Coffinswood. The orcs have been defeated. Do the humans suffer the death toll? It was much less than had been anticipated. Eric was hailed as a hero, and his good fortune didn't end there, for he has gotten his greatest wish of all. Camel was captured, and he left her to rot in the keep's prison. Those were Eric's finest moments, just before his downfall. Poppy wasn't alone. She whispered in the ears of many, and managed to convince a whole host of Eric's opposers to fight by her side against him. In the assault, the keep's prison has been broken into. Kamali and Rigo were unshackled. Eric, his two chief lieutenants, and some of the rest of his close followers were slain. This marked the end of the rule of Eric Caladon, first of the washers to rule Coffinswood. A great darkness had descended upon the land the very hour Caladon had fallen, believed to be an ill omen from the gods. It was said that the Watcher had forsaken Coffinswood upon his death. Indeed, it was the beginning of the dark days. Days where graves began to turn up empty, where the dead rose from the earth. Days became nights, and nights were darker still. Coffinswood lived in ever-growing darkness. Do not let your hearts be troubled. It's always darkest before dawn. Though the evil closes round, let your hearts be still, like the eye of the storm. Give not into doubt, the gods do not forsake us. Find within yourself the anchor that you need to weather the storm. Turn your eyes from the darkness, this place will be redeemed. Find that single shaft of light, and keep the hope alive. Millennial Cadence Sawyer The reign of the council was cut short. Kamali was seen traveling south and later found dead. It was unknown why she was traveling south alone without escort. But such is life in Narumer. Not every death is glorious. Many can die for being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Such was Kamali's death. A death without a date, without witnesses, unheard and unseen. A second councilman was killed in a bar brawl. Third, a councilwoman perished to a trap in a cave. The council has been utterly decimated. This marked the end of the dark days. In the break of a new dawn, a new leader emerged, Zajir Hazid Khalid, naming himself Sil Pasha of Coffinswood, master of all guilds. Little is known of how quickly he rose to power, but unlike Caladon and the council that had come before him, the Silpasha could not be troubled by the quality of life of the people over which he ruled. 
he was far more interested in building a mighty trading empire after the great city of his homeland than he cared about the well-being of his people. Rarely in the public eye, he kept mostly to the keep and left the day-to-day -day running of the government to his four advisors. The Silpasha gained the reputation of a man not of the people. Once again, Cadence returned to Coffinswood. Once again, dissent began to grow. Once more it was Poppy Twill at the helm. After being pushed aside following her trial and the downfall of the council, she began whispering in the ears of the people, sowing discord. Those whispers came to the attention of a very powerful man by the name Jasper the Wolf, sitting comfortably in his hideout somewhere on the island. Jasper was somewhat of an enigma to the residents of Coffinswood. He did not arrive with the washers, yet wielded an enormous amount of power, and commanded his own group of thugs. Where Jasper lived, how he gained his wealth and fortune, was a mystery. His involvement in Coffinswood was about to set forth an unfortunate chain of events. In broad daylight, Jasper executed the Silpasha on the hill of the keep in front of everyone to see. Immediately taking his position as leader of Coffinswood, no one would dare to challenge Jasper. His skills with blades were legendary. Some said his blades were always poisoned, and there were even rumors that he wore an amulet that could set men on fire. And yet, behind closed doors, the militia of Coffinswood began gathering their forces in opposition to Jasper. In the midst of the chaos, Cadence wrote a letter to the elves, seeking sanctuary. I am writing to you to request permission to dwell in La Russas to serve the people. I wish to also make clear to you that I no longer speak for Coffinswood. New men have come forward seeking power, and for all my service and toil, I am pushed aside. They have not learned the lessons of the past, but it does not matter, for I grow weary of life among them. I have survived four governments this year, and of the fourth has fallen and the fifth rises. I will not serve another tyrant. In Coffinswood, a rebellion against Jasper was brewing. Sir Roderick Callendar emerges the leader of the rebellion, a man who previously held no rank or title in Coffinswood, but his hatred of Jasper in seeing the injustice and chaos had given him new zeal and a desire to see his sword drip with Jasper's blood. In a first for Coffinswood, Roderick was a leader who practically had unanimous support. The entirety of Coffinswood sought to dispose of Jasper. And so, in the tavern of Coffinswood, the Lucky Sphinx, there was a bloodbath. Sir Roderick Callender perished, alongside with many of his ardent supporters. Under Jasper, Coffinswood became a town of blood and chaos. But just when it seemed that things couldn't get any worse, they did. In the midst of the chaos, a far more powerful being than anyone could have ever imagined sought to take advantage of the chaos. A red wizard named Aram Aset, who has act out an existence amidst the orcs of the north, used the chaos to his advantage and arrived into Coffinswood. A battle ensued between the defenders of Coffinswood and Aram with his force of orcs. His fireballs rained over the citadel. And Coffinswood burned in a great fire of the Red Wizard's making. Aram then set himself up in the Keep Tower of Coffinswood. Only the inn and the Keep survived the Great Burning. On this field of blood and ash, cold air meets colder bodies of heroes shortly slain. An eerie, endless sky and scorched earth are all they are to rest with. Age of size matters not now. They all await Kalimvor's scales. Callis. But a glimpse of hope in the darkness, the death, and the chaos. For there were those who survived and managed to flee Coffinswood, dispersing into the rest of Narumer. Throughout the battle, Jasper was nowhere to be seen, and once again returned to his hideout. Gather round 
and you shall hear a tale of history of elves and gnomes, of dwarves and men and their bravery, of the find who dared enslave them all, control their destiny, of the many battles fought and won to keep their sovereignty. 1372, in Myrtle's final days, broke a part of Eastern Shore, a vessel full of slaves. From Daggerford they had all come, upon the wind and waves, they made to dwell in Coffin's Wood, under the Watcher's gaze. But with these souls another came, another wrecked as they, wicked and malevolent, a mage from the land of Thay. Patient was the enemy, careful plans he laid, he sought an artifact of power, and waited for his day. Passes, filled and cleared again, winter turned to spring, Shantia's bounty multiplied, the songbirds came to sing. In Coffin's Wood, three polities fell and rose again. None could stand the test of time among the race of men. Then, after this, another rose, a proud and selfish man, the son of a noble family from the deserts of Kalim Shan. With strength and might, he ruled the wood, secluded in his keep, scheming how to tame the guilds to line his pockets deep. Then, at last, the rest could take no more, declaring in one shout, We want you here not any more. Go, for we throw you out. The people rose in murderous rage, chaotic revelry. Once pristine streets ran red with blood by illegality. Watching from the shadows near, the madges rasped in glee. These fools have slaughtered all their guards by their disunity. He unleashed his army of orc and gnome, laughing maniacally, burnt all the homes with conjured fire, and moved into the keep. The people, they were forced to flee before the winds of turning, for by the breath of the dragon rogue, Coffin's Wood lay burning. They came onto a lighthouse near, on beach of sand and spray, and crying out unto the gods, fell on their knees to pray. Cadence The human refugees, at first dispersed, eventually began finding each other, and made out a small community just outside the gates to the elven lands in what was an old orcish fort. Of those that remained alive was Rhetoric Thalas, last sergeant of Coffinswood, Rhetoric, alongside the rest of the living militia, Jervis Wolvern and Baden Swain, swore an oath to return the people of Coffinswood to their rightful home. Grim and defeated were the refugees, yet the island was ever ebbing and flowing, and new washers began arriving at the refugee camp, only to join them in that solemn atmosphere. Within that despairing mood in the makeshift camp, a bard emerged named Jeremiah Blue Eyes and regaled the crowd with his stories, poems and charisma. And yet the old militia, the fallen of Coffinswood, did not recognize him as leader and blatantly refused his ideas. It was during that time that Sir Baron de Valgo washed ashore, paladin of Torm, knight of the Golden Lion. He arrived at the refugee camp and, unburdened by the melancholy of the lost city, became Jeremiah's confidant, and in turn Lord Jeremiah's made him defender of the refugee camp and gave him the title Knight Protector. Sir Baron bravely defended the makeshift refugee camp, earning the respect and friendship of several elves and men, even those of the old militia. Baron succeeded against all odds at recounseling the fallen of Coffinswood to the people. He made Rhetoric Thalas the sergeant of the newly formed legion. Now, with joint forces, the humans settle in a hillside shore east of Coffinswood, in a new hamlet which they dubbed Stormhold. At first, 
it was nothing more than a corner of sand, grass and hills. But Stormhold soon became the tent town of the refugees. Stormhold was under the western shadows of Coffinswood, where a great red haze lingered. Foul darkness that could be seen from the distance covering the skies. Near that cloud of darkness, the humans lived. Rhetoric Thalas was made captain of the militia. Alongside the militia, a new knights organization was formed, led by Roald Vanderfell. He swore in Isabel Mansorian, who was the first female knight of the organization. The humans, alongside with halflings and half-breeds, were beginning to organize as a true civilized settlement. They were beginning to live out not as disorderly refugees, but as free men and women. There was hope. Hope that the humans can endure, that they can outlast the darkness. As the days chase the nights, will the gods hear our plea? Will the winds bring us hope on the waves of the sea? Its harsh beauty still holds us, and our hopes may yet live. Like a cliff tall waves breaking, our strength will not give. Though the danger that surrounds us, all as one will we stand. To remember all strifing, us will bring to an end. For before we are freedom, ever hope to regain, we must find strength together, just alive to remain. Gilaren Anatar. Yet the darkness in coffins would only grew. There were whispers of a war to come. The omens began with the death of Baron. Rumors said that he had meddled in the affairs of Jasper the Wolf and that he, in turn, finished him off. What followed were even more deaths, especially hard for Stormhold were the deaths of Captain Rhetoric Thalas and the knight Isabel Mansorian, who was rumored to be his lover. Their bodies laid in a cold, lifeless embrace on the outskirts of Coffinswood, in the territory of the Red Wizard. The people of Stormhold, who saw the bodies of Rhetoric and Isabel, couldn't believe their eyes that had welled up with tears. It was on that day that the Red Wizard had emerged from the shadows and claimed their death was for trespassing into his city. You will not trespass again, said Aram. You will leave my minions be and you will pay a tribute as a peace offer and make the tribute worthy so that I might see you all as worthy for now. He spoke and disappeared into the shadows. Nobody knew what tribute the wizard wanted, but it was becoming clearer and clearer that without an all-out war, the humans, as well as the rest of the island, will forever live under his shadow. A final battle was brewing. Deep within the mountain, in vaulted halls of stone, where shine the silver fountains, there lies the dwarven home. The light of many lanterns on long oak tables falls, fine-shaped metal sketching that ring with ale and songs. Bright gems like starlet shining, the silver like the moon, and golden bells pure chiming, earth gives us as a boon. Stones taken from the darkness, to light and life we bring, and metals dull and blunting, make us true blades to sing. As heat spills from the anvil, as sturdy hammer falls, to Moradin, our father, the craftsman's stout heart calls. Song of a Dwarven Home, Gilaran. The day began like any other in the kingdom of Kalandur, with the barking of a dog and the howling of the wind. Except more dwarfs than usual gathered in Iron Hill, the exterior of the frozen stronghold. They could feel it in the wind, even in the cracks in the ice. It foretold of a great battle to come. Something indeed was stirring in the heart of the island. Thane Thoric Stoneshield officially received tidings of the war preparations in Stormhold. 
Though the dwarves don't tend to meddle in human affairs, Thoric knew in his heart of hearts that the Red Wizard would stop at nothing and would eventually reach the Dwarven stronghold. The Dwarven leader reasoned a united front with the humans and the elves was their best chance to defeat him. We leave for the south, proclaimed Thoric. Know this, be prepared to fight. The toughest battle of your life, perhaps. Kelkarak Stoneshoulder, a cleric of Gorm, asked Lord Thoric to let him take the oath of protection. He kneeled at Thoric and said, Beneath the gaze of the sentinel Gorm Gulfin and all the Mordin Seman, I, Kelkarak of Stoneshoulder, do give the oath of protection over Thoric of Stoneshield, Lord and Thane of Kalandur, my will his guardian, my body his shield, my life in place of his, it be me honor to be having ye as me charge, Lord. Barakor Kelkarak of Stoneshoulder answered Thoric, I give you the title First War Priest of Kalandur in service of the defense and myself, and I would have none other than a priest of the bronze warrior be at my side. Throughout the isle, the air is suddenly very heavy and tinted with a taste of copper. The dwarves cough and spat. Time was now the enemy. Before we go, said Thoric to his dwarven warriors, this might very well become one of the greatest battles you'll ever see. If any of us are to fall, it will be with honor. And it was an honor being able to serve you as Thane. The bridge operator, Bunus, lowered the bridge gate at what may very well be the last time he does so. For Moradin and the Morgan Seman, for Gorm and the Hold, cried the dwarves as they began to march towards the great bridge which divided their kingdom from the rest of the island. As the dwarves traveled south to Stormhold, without warning, birds began falling out of the air, dead, all across the isle. At the horizon, in the dark sky above Coffinswood, a purple, boiling mass of cloud loomed. The dwarves made haste, and after a long journey, arrived at Stormhold. You, dwarves, get in here and shut that gate, shouted someone at the dwarves. With that, the dwarves entered the town of Tents, Stormhold. An army of all the races of Naromer gathered in Stormhold. The largest force was the humans, led by Roald Vanderfell, leader of the human forces. About two dozen strong, by his side was Jervis from the fallen of Coffinswood. He has long awaited for a chance to reclaim the lost city, and now he also wanted to avenge for rhetoric. Roald drew his sword. The time has come. Draw your weapons. We march to the walls of Coffinswood. From the south, we will call for battle. The wizard will answer. Today, we go forth in arms for the safety of our people, said Thea, the elven priestess of Corallon. Our strength is our unity and our faith. Remember, do not fear death for it is only another step on the journey. Do not fear Sahanain's call, for all we have to fear is dishonor. This day, the Seldorine are with us. This day, we are not the lost but the chosen. May Corallon guide your swords as Solonor does your arrows. And remember, we are Telquasir. For Corallon, for our people. Thoric Stone Shield held his axe eye. Praise to Moradin, he cried out in Dwarvish. All the dwarves raised their weapons too and shouted their battle cries. Let us march with them. If we are to die, I'll gladly die with you all. The finest lot of dwarves I've ever had the honor being with. The armies marched forth from the beach of Stormhold and arrived at the southern walls of Coffinswood. To Jervis, the last time he was there, 
he saw the body of his captain Redrick. To him, this day was much about avenging the death of his old captain. The army stood by the walls of Coffinswood. Roald, in an attempt to lure the Red Wizard out of the city, cried for him to come out and face him. Something was stirring in the tower keep of Coffinswood. A fireball emerged from the window and straight towards the combined armies. It blazed through the ground where many of the attackers stood. The death count officially started. Some began calling to retreat. Others were recovering bodies and tending to the injured. Cadence was among the healing and helping to pull back the injured ones. She glared at Roald. Was this your brilliant plan? Roald eyed the citadel. If he will not come to us, then we will come to him. Onwards to Coffinswood. For Rhetoric, cried Jervis. The three armies barged through the wooden gates, elven arrows whizzing through the air. As the three armies fought in the red haze, death was mounting on both sides. Swords were bloodied and quivers were emptied. To the tower, to the tower, break through to the tower, cried Roald, as the united army fought their way to the kill. With the dwarves forging the way in battle formation, the armies arrived to the keep's main doors. What do you want, fool? asked the statue of the Red Wizard with an almost mechanical voice. Leave me, and you might yet live. I want to speak to you. Eye to eye, wizard of thigh. Go away, and you might yet live, repeated the statue in its mechanical voice. Our fight is within the tower now. Now, to the tower, cried Roald. The keep's door was breached. The minions of the dark wizard could not hold them back. Cadence led the way, the only one familiar enough with the keep up through the stairs and into the library. The remaining army, led by the might of the Dwarven force, battled in the halls of the keep with broken swords, axes and empty quivers. The elven priestess of Corellon, Thea Moonshadow, had perished. Also among the elven dead were Anilas Delisu, Elith Luisar, and Lilith Nightsong, the single gnome that fought Kuril Silvershaper was no longer amongst the living. He perished to a fireball. The armies have gotten so far that visible now from the last chamber of the tower in front of the attackers was Aram Aset, the infamous Red Wizard, who was seen hurling fireballs with no regards to his minions' death. Roald Vanderfell saw his forces take the heaviest toll in the number of deaths. Roald himself, badly injured by now, could not have escaped the barrage of fireballs and was burnt to death. The leader of the human forces, the booming voice in charge of the United Front, had perished. Disorder ensued. In the emerging chaos, whatever hope was held on to was beginning to vanquish. The united army of the free folks of Narrowmare were held at a standoff. The Red Wizard's minions formed a wall to defend him as he weaved his dark magic, whereas the breeze that had fallen from the ceiling held off any thoughts of retreat. Thoric knew that if they simply stood their ground, they would all perish as Roald and the rest of them did, most likely burnt alive. Now is the time, shouted Thoric. Attack! For Gorm! Give it all you have! The dwarves had charged forth onto the Red Wizard. Dark magic then blinded the dwarves and a cloud of poison cracked the dwarven formation. In the confusion and darkness, somehow, some way, Thoric was overrun. In pitch darkness, this said that Thoric fought bravely. 
unrelentlessly. But the fell beasts swarmed him. The dwarves rushed to save Thoric, but it was too late. Thus perished Thoric Stoneshield, leader of the dwarven forces, fighting bravely, a hero's death. Loud outbursts of agony and mourning echoed in the halls of the keep. The dwarves put their helmets down and stopped fighting at that moment, while others held a line against the minions. It was in that very moment that the dwarves would decide to avenge their dead leader, driven by all manners of rage and fury, in a fit of berserk madness, the dwarves charged through the Red Wizard's minions and steamrolled past the cloud of fog and darkness. Past all the darkness, they were set to make it as close as they could to the Red Wizard, no matter what was in their path. The Red Wizard was within their grasp now. Battle cries raged. It was then that Balanor of Brightforge landed the final blow. Aramaset, the Red Wizard, had fallen. The Red Haze, the seemingly eternal signature of the fallen city, was finally lifted. Darkness was turned to light. Victory was achieved. And the rain and the cold Broken mass of the ships On that graveyard of old We washed up on the shore Of the forbidden mile Each soul secrets unfold To the side of our eyes Narrow mare, narrow mare Will you let us depart? Will you let us set sail to the lands of our heart? Narrow mare, narrow mare, will you let us depart? Will you let us set sail to the lands of our heart? As the days chase the nights, will the gods see rapidly? Will the wind springs us up on the waves of the sea? Its harsh beauty still holds us, and our hopes may yet live. Like a cliff always breaking, us the strength will not give. Narrow mare, narrow mare, will you? Us depart, will you let us set sail to the lands of our heart? Naru Mer, Naru Mer, will you let us depart? Will you let us set sail to the lands of our heart? Though the danger surrounds us, 
Always one will we stand To remember all striving As we'll bring to an end For before we are freedom Ever hope to regain We must find strength together Just to love to remain Narumer, Narumer Will you let us depart? Until then will you be Ever home to our hearts Narumer, Narumer Will you let us depart? Until then will you be Ever home to us